Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless jesus said as a sign of his coming and the end of the age there would be an increase in deception false christ who will deceive many wars and rumors of wars nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom famines pestilences earthquakes christian persecution apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Beirut, Lebanon, explosions as the Israeli Defense Forces retaliate against that deadly strike of the other day in the Golan Heights. Our Trey Yinkst is live for us in Jerusalem. He's got the latest. Uh, who was targeted here, Trey? Right now, we're gathering information following a massive explosion in southern Beirut. We understand, according to the Israeli military, this was an airstrike targeting a Hezbollah commander that the Israelis say is responsible for the deaths of those 12 children and teens in Masjid al-Shams in the northern part of the Golan Heights on Saturday. Remember, this is how all of it began over the weekend, that Iran-made rocket slamming into a soccer field and killing 12 young souls. The Israelis promising that they would respond, and it appears this is the response. Currently, there are no fresh instructions for Israeli civilians amid a possible retaliation by Hezbollah following this strike in the suburbs of Beirut. But we should note we are getting initial statements from senior Israeli military leadership, including Israel's defense minister, Yoav Gallant, who just moments ago tweeted out, quote, Hezbollah crossed the red line. Now, I've been speaking with Israeli officials throughout the past two days, trying to get an understanding of the thought process about how the Israelis would plan to respond to that rocket attack on Saturday that killed those 12 people. The defense minister is describing a red line that was crossed. Earlier today, Hezbollah was continuing rocket and drone attacks into northern Israel. They actually killed one civilian, and it really illustrates the picture of how violent this group is and how often they've been attacking northern Israel since October 8th, firing thousands of rockets into the northern part of this country. But again, what we can report at this hour, there has been an Israeli airstrike in the suburbs of Beirut, Lebanon, targeting a senior Hezbollah commander that the Israelis say is responsible for that rocket attack that killed 12 young souls in the Druze village of Majd al-Shams on Saturday. Crossing the wires right now, Trey, is that the U.S. is to pursue diplomacy to avoid escalation between Israel and Hezbollah. Uh, the State Department was just giving a briefing moments ago, said the U.S. will continue pursuing diplomacy to avert escalation in this conflict. Here's the direct quote from the State Department spokesperson. We're continuing to work toward a diplomatic resolution that would allow Israeli and Lebanese civilians to return to their homes and live in peace and security. We certainly want to avoid any kind of escalation. We're continuing to work toward a diplomatic resolution that would allow Israeli and Lebanese civilians to return to their homes and live in peace and security. First Thessalonians 5.3 While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. Over the past nearly 10 months, Hezbollah has been directly involved in this fight, launching attacks toward Israeli population centers, and they've even expanded those attacks all along the border between Israel and Lebanon. The Israelis have warned time and time again, if these attacks lead to the deaths of civilians, they will respond accordingly. We're currently in uncharted territory because Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of the Iran-backed group Hezbollah, in the past has threatened to target Tel Aviv, the city that we're currently in, if the Israelis target Beirut. Again, the defense minister in Israel tonight saying 
that Hezbollah crossed a red line by targeting those civilians in Masjid al-Shams over the weekend. And now the question is whether or not Hezbollah will respond and make good on those threats. We should put all of this into context, though, in the larger efforts by the Americans to try and de-escalate the situation along the northern border. As we speak, there are tens of thousands of Israelis who are internally displaced. They are living in hotels in cities like Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. They are displaced from their homes as a result of anti-tank guided missile attacks along the border and that continuous rocket fire being launched by Hezbollah from southern Lebanon. In addition to that, you have the American efforts underway. Amos Hochstein, a top advisor to President Biden, has been shuttling messages back and forth between Washington and Beirut, trying to de-escalate the situation, understanding that there are no direct conversations taking place between Hezbollah and the Israelis. We should note here, according to all of the reporting that we've done on the ground, Israeli officials have expressed concern and a lack of confidence in that American-led process to de-escalate the situation along the border. They understand that not only are people displaced from their homes, but now the death toll is rising, not just among civilians, but also among soldiers that are operating along the, along the border. We've been speaking with military officials over the past several weeks, even before that rocket attack that targeted Masjid al-Shams, to try and understand if and when there would be an Israeli operation into Lebanon. But I take you back to 2006, the second Lebanon war, the devastation to Lebanon as a country and to Beirut as a capital was so significant that Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah, said if he knew that, he would have never attacked Israel. And so the question tonight is whether or not Hezbollah will respond to this strike in Beirut, Lebanon, that according to the Israelis has taken out a senior Hezbollah commander responsible for the deaths of those 12 young Druze civilians over the weekend. Daniel 9, 26 and 27. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with the flood, until the end of the war desolations are determined. Then he, the Antichrist, shall confirm a covenant with many, who is Israel, the Palestinians, and possibly other Muslim nations, for one week, which is seven years. But in the middle of the week, three and a half years, he, the Antichrist, shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wings of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even unto the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. In Bible prophecy, we are told in Daniel 9, 26 and 27, the prince who is to come, who is the Antichrist, will come on the world scene and strongly confirm a seven-year covenant of peace in the Middle East between Israel and her enemies. This covenant will kick off the seven-year tribulation. 1 Thessalonians 5, 3 while people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. So how does peace and security lead to sudden destruction? And what is the sudden destruction? Is it the rapture of the church? Is it the revealing of the Antichrist? Is it war? While we can conjecture what the sudden destruction is, the Apostle Paul tells us Christians are not part of it. The Apostle Paul says this in 1 Thessalonians 4, 15-18. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. In these verses of scripture, the Apostle Paul is undoubtedly talking about the rapture of the church. The Apostle Paul continues in 1 Thessalonians 5.3, For when they say peace and security, then sudden destruction comes upon them, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. The Apostle Paul makes a distinction between we and they. In 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul says, We who are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, along with the dead in Christ, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. In 1 Thessalonians 5.3, Paul says, While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. This sudden destruction that comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape, could very well be when the rapture occurs. This sudden destruction comes upon them while they are saying peace and security. Sudden destruction comes, and this is where the distinction the Apostle Paul makes comes into play. They will not escape. That would seemingly indicate that we escape as we read in Luke 21:36. Watch therefore, 
and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Sudden is the Greek word epnidios, which means unexpected, suddenly. Destruction is the Greek word alethros, which means ruin, i.e. death, punishment. 1 Thessalonians 5.3 could be translated like this. For when they say peace and security, then unexpected and sudden punishment comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. Could it be that this sudden destruction is the rapture of the church? 1 Corinthians 15.52 tells us that the rapture will happen suddenly, in the twinkling of an eye. 1 Corinthians 15.50-54 Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Twinkling is the Greek word repay, which means a jerk of the eye. By analogy, an instant, i.e. suddenly. Is the sudden destruction coming, and with it the rapture of the church? We see the prophesied Antichrist right onto the world stage in Revelation 6-2. Immediately following the rider of the white horse beginning his conquest of the world, we see peace will be taken from the earth when the rider of the red horse of war begins his ride across the earth as we read in Revelation 6-3 and 4. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see, another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. Those who are here to see this will be as those who lived in the days of Noah. All will be well and life will be moving forward as normal when suddenly a flood of God's judgment will begin to fall on mankind which will last for seven years, the culmination of which will be the visible, physical, bodily return of Jesus Christ to the earth at Armageddon. So as we look at what prophecy predicts is going to occur, potentially in the not too distant future, the world is someday going to rejoice that peace has finally come to the Middle East. What will follow that, however, will be anything but peace as the world is suddenly going to explode into warfare. Is the sudden destruction coming, and with it the rapture of the church, the revealing of the Antichrist, and war? All those who believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior will not be here to see the terrible time to come wherein God's judgment will fall upon a world that has forgotten him. Where will we be? In the presence of Jesus Christ our Lord as a result of the rapture of the church. And there will be no announcement as to when that will take place whatsoever prior to it occurring. And if you find yourself here after it occurs, your future is going to be horrific. The stage is being set for Daniel's prophecy concerning the arrival of the Antichrist, which will be preceded by the rapture of the church. The only conclusion one can draw from all this is this. Jesus Christ is coming soon. Consider this a heads up if you're a Christian and be forewarned if you're a non-believer. If you're watching this and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's time to get to know him, and the sooner the better. Turning now to Venezuela, where violent protests have erupted over allegations that Sunday's presidential election was stolen by the country's authoritarian leader, Nicolas Maduro. The opposition candidate, who was strongly favored in the polls, says he has proof that he won. <laughs> It was widespread chaos on the streets of Venezuela Monday. As thousands of demonstrators across the country protested what they say was an attempt by President Nicolás Maduro to steal the country's presidential election. We were there as a brawl erupted in the capital in Caracas. A group of protesters in the front of the line throwing the canisters of tear gas back at police. There's a lot of police motorcycles here confronting them. You're seeing a lot of tear gas. The group of protesters back there, some of them told us that they assembled peacefully and that's when police started rioting and all of this confrontation started taking place. Soy Nicolás Maduro Moro, Presidente. Maduro claimed victory for a third six-year term, while challenger Edmundo González claimed to have the proof that he received 70% of the vote against Maduro's 30. President Maduro took office in 2013, and during his presidency, more than 7 million citizens have fled the country over poverty and violence, many to the U.S.-Mexico border. Blanca Suarez was among those who fled with her young boys, but returned home to vote and hope for a regime change. 
She says no Venezuelan would want to brave the jungle risking violence, rape and death, but says now it's a necessity for her. And this morning, the opposition has called for peaceful but massive protests, as they say, for people to defend the truth and allow for a transition to happen. There is grave concern about what they could be met with. Luke 2125, and there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. One of the many signs we are living in the last days, right before the return of Jesus Christ, is nations will be in a state of perplexity or uncertainty over what to do in a difficult situation. This is exactly what is happening in our world today. Now, curfews in Bangladesh have been relaxed slightly as students there continue their protests over government job quotas. People can now go out for seven hours during the day and some offices are open. It's allowing some movement. There have been weeks of unrest in the country as protesters fight with security forces. The protest and street violence may have ended for now, but police in Bangladesh are arresting more student protesters and opposition members. On Monday, student leaders made some new demands. Ensure security on all campuses and release all our students. I came here taking a great risk and I'm afraid. There are members of intelligence agencies everywhere following us. Once the media leaves, perhaps I could be even missing. A civilized and independent nation cannot run like this. The U.S. State Department, the United Nations, the European Union and several international rights bodies have condemned the recent violence and called for an investigation. The initial protests were against the government job quota system, but after the crackdown that followed, killed nearly 200 people and injured thousands more. Many are now demanding accountability. There is an atmosphere of fear and panic in Bangladesh, among some as arrests and crackdowns continue by security forces. On Friday late afternoon, plainclothes policemen forcibly took Nahid Islam, Asif Mahmood and Abu Bakr Mojumdar from a hospital in Dhaka, where they say they were being treated for injuries sustained while in police custody several days ago. All three are key organizers of the Kota Reform protest movement. Naid's wife and sister are now worried about their security, fearing they might also be picked up by police. We are all under constant surveillance. Today in the late afternoon, the intelligence personnel dragged my brother and two other student leaders from the hospital room while they were under treatment. Intelligence people also refused to dis disclose their identity. The Home Minister says the students were detained for their safety without mentioning where they are being held. This is Asif Mahmoud's interview from Thursday. They took us away to stop us from making any decisions about the student movement while they killed all these people. They made some of us disappear. Some were beaten. We were pressured to stop the movement. Four other student protester coordinators left the hospital in Dhaka, fearing their imminent arrest. Now they are hiding. We managed to talk to one of them over a mobile phone. We are feeling very insecure. We could be arrested any moment and they could just make us disappear. We are living in a nightmare scenario. Unless you experience it, you won't understand it. Protests will continue until the government accepts our nine-point demands. Please pray for us. The government is continuing to say that things are normal, yet everything seems to be very tense. And people also want to know why it happened, how it happened, why so many people got killed. Stop killing us! Stop killing us! Stop killing us! A message for President William Ruto as people gathered in Nairobi's financial center to remember those killed in protests during the past month. Families of the victims carried a makeshift coffin, trying to make their way to the office of the president to deliver a petition demanding justice. Security forces moved in quickly to arrest one of the organizers, Boniface Mwangi, who remained defiant. We have protests about Stop police killings killing and police brutality. They have killed over 16 of our comrades. Us. That's why we are here. They are kidnapping young people and killing them. Stop That's why we are protesting today. A few minutes later, he was taken away. This is David Chege's mother. 
Her son was shot and killed outside Parliament on June 25th. He was 32 years old. No one has been charged in connection with his death, nor any of the other more than 50 people killed. The few demonstrators who came out to mark the one month since their loved ones have been killed in these uh, anti-government protests have been arrested and taken away. The woman we just saw put in the back of a police van was screaming, you have killed my child, you have killed my child, as she was being taken away. President Ruto addressed the nation on Wednesday, insisting he had heard the people. For now, security forces have managed to crush further unrest, and Ruto retains his tight grip on power. Is global chaos the new normal? As anyone can plainly see, the world is in a state of decay, moral, economic, political, every way possible. People are saying the world is out of control and looking for someone, anyone, to rescue the planet. Soon, very soon, a leader will appear on the horizon that appears to have all the answers, to calm the oceans, to bring peace to all the nations. His title will be the Antichrist, and he will be welcomed by millions of those on earth not taken with the rapture. Unfortunately, his true identity will be known soon to those left behind that his true intentions are death, destruction, and control. So yes, global chaos is the new normal until the Lord Jesus Christ comes at the end of the Antichrist's seven-year reign of terror and establishes true peace on earth. It seems like a good time for Satan to present the lawless one to the world. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7-12 For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion, that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Psalm 917 the wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. Now to something we've covered extensively here, the raging wildfires in the West, where new flames have erupted in Arizona and Colorado. And the Park Fire in Northern California is spreading. It has now become the sixth largest wildfire ever in that state. In football terms, Cal Fire this morning is in offense thanks to cooler temperatures. You're actually watching them set what are known as backfires, burning through all of this dry vegetation to stop the main fire in its tracks. The park fire does continue to grow this morning, pushing into the north. Meanwhile, overnight, additional evacuation orders were issued. After nearly a week of battling towering flames, the park fire is still raging with minimal containment. Reinforcements have arrived and almost 5,000 firefighters are now battling the blaze. We saw this thing just explode. It sounds like some of these forests haven't burned in decades. Yeah, so like it's just dead fuel. Ground and aerial teams are fighting heat and rugged terrain to prevent wind-driven embers from igniting more forest. We had spot fires and we lost a couple hundred acres, but with the crews and the air attack and the helicopters that were uh, putting in good work yesterday, they were able to kind of contain the, those couple hundred acres. What is clear this morning is the scale of loss. More than 370,000 acres burned, more than 100 structures, many of them homes lost. A once picturesque region now in ruins. Multiple landslides caused by heavy monsoon rains have swept away villages in Wayanad district. It happened in the early hours on Tuesday, trapping people in their homes while they slept. Search and rescue teams have been trying to reach the hundreds believed to be trapped under the mud and debris. We fear that uh, the gravity of this uh, tragedy um, is much more than these numbers. The army has deployed more than 200 soldiers to help teams from the state emergency service. 
but the unstable terrain, destroyed roads and a collapsed bridge are hindering efforts. Several injured people have been taken to hospital. There were about five to eight people with me. They were all swept away. I saw them being swept away. I don't know what's happened to them. I don't know if they're alive or if they've been rescued. I carried my mother on my shoulders. Heavy rains, flooding and mudslides are common in Kerala during the monsoon season from June to September. In 2018, nearly 500 people were killed in the state in one of the worst floods on record. Jesus said a sign of his return would be more frequent and more intense weather as we read in Matthew 24, 7 and 8. And there will be famines, pestilences and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. God has used plagues in the form of extreme weather in the past and will again in the future. The seventh plague on Egypt was hail. Don't forget about the famine in Joseph's time. One of the biggest is the flood in the book of Genesis. In the future, during the seven-year tribulation, God will once again use extreme weather in the form of pestilence as judgment. In Revelation 16:21, God uses hailstones weighing 100 pounds each, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. In Revelation 16:8 and 9, God uses scorching heat. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat. And they blaspheme the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. So when Jesus Christ warns us that just before his second coming, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, you had better believe that these occurrences are a sign from God and that he is about to intervene. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for not recognizing the signs of his first coming as we read in Matthew 16, 1-3. Then the Pharisees and Sadducees came, and testing him, asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said to them, When it is evening, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. The religious leaders of Jesus' day had full knowledge of the prophecies of the Messiah. Yet these religious leaders ignored the signs and still rejected him. If the religious leaders of Jesus' day missed the signs of Jesus' first coming, how much more important is it for us today to pay close attention to the signs of Jesus' second coming? The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world, as we know it, is near. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A, admit that you're a sinner. B, believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised them from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with Him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in Him, and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. God, what if his appearance
coherence occurs on a Sunday morning. My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready! Get ready! Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.